Welcome back. I'm here again with Debbie Jordan Cobble. Debbie, welcome back. Thank you. Okay, so we talked about your initial experiences from intruders, but there's been 40 years of time that has passed since that event, or roughly, actually, no, it's almost exactly 40 years. Mm-hmm. We're we're almost there within three months or so, two months. Yep. So during that gulf of time, what has happened since then with these beings? Well, I think the last time I actually had something strange happen where I actually think I saw something you know, a being was back in 93, right before I had a total hysterectomy. And I was with our house guest, her daughter and my late husband. And we were living out on a farm and we heard some beeping noises and saw a light out in the sky. So we all ran outside and my late husband was videotaping with his camera, but you really couldn't see much. It was, you know, this was before fancy technology kicked in. Something was riling up the cows in the barn and you can hear on the audio part of the videotape, you can hear my house guest daughter say, mama, what's that walking down the road towards us? And I was standing at the end of the driveway and I remember this is a country road and it was kind of dark, but I could see something walking down the road. And in my mind, I thought I'm looking dead on at a really strange deer with the big head and then the little skinny body and the way it was kind of walking. And I thought in my mind, it was a deer walking toward me. And then you hear my friend's daughter scream. And then the next thing on the videotape, the counter jumps 18 minutes until you can hear my late husband talking on his shortwave radio handset to another ham radio operator on the other side of town, asking him if he sees these weird lights that we're seeing, and he's thinking he's seeing the northern lights, but there's no way in Kokomo, Indiana, that we're seeing the northern lights, so we don't know what that is. But as I said, you hear her scream, and then literally 18 minutes later is when the tape starts again. And I don't even know how that would happen on a VHS tape in a big, one of those giant camcorders. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how that could even possibly happen, how that is even possible. And that was the last time I had a weird encounter like that on a physical level. But also, I was changing inside as well. I was becoming more intuitive. Mm -hmm. I was noticing things that I hadn't noticed before. Like I, I, I noticed that I could walk down the grocery store aisle at Walmart. And if I got close enough to the person that I would pass, it was like, I could see their entire life flash before my eyes in an instant, you know, this knowing, and it it continued to get stronger and stronger. And I remember one time literally standing in a Walmart and I was looking at the selections of salads, trying to figure out which bag of salad I was going to get. And I felt someone looking at me and I turned to look and there was this very tall, very thin, younger man, kind of goth looking with black hair and wearing black clothes, you know, and he had really dark brown eyes. He was looking right at me and he had this weird looking smile on his face. And I distinctly felt as if he said, can you see me? But I didn't see him talk. And I looked away real quick because it startled me. I wasn't scared, but it startled me. I'm like, what? And then I, when I looked back, he was gone. And I'm like, oh, hell no. This guy ain't getting away that quick. And I took off running down the salad aisle, went to the end. I was running, looking down each aisle. There's no way that guy could have gotten away that quickly. And he was gone. Not in that store. Things like that started happening a lot. That's really creepy, though. Why? I mean, what do you think that uh, was? I have no idea. I have no idea. I you felt think it was a it, being, a ghost, like a. I don't know. I was, I, and I almost felt like it was a test. And then one time I was running my machines at work, and you know I ran a surface mount line, and I ran uh, what they call small chip component placement machines. 
and they were programmed by the engineers. So they ran at a certain speed. And if you didn't have any breakdowns for your shift, you should be able to make X amount of boards in X amount. We're talking about circuit boards, X amount mm-hmm. of circuit boards in X amount of time. Generally, if I ran well, I would be done at about one o'clock and my shift was over at 2.30. And that gave me plenty of time to clean up and prep or whatever for the next shift. Well, my machine started running. I started over a period of a couple of weeks. I started noticing that I was getting done with no errors at noon. And I'm like, what the hell? So one of my engineers comes down one day and I'm like, you guys been messing with the machines? Have you sped this up? Because they're notorious for that. And he's like, no. And I'm like, are you sure? Don't mess with me. And he's like, no, I wouldn't do that. He goes, if I was going to do that, I would tell you. And I'm like, okay. So I'm sitting there doing my crossword puzzle and drinking my coffee on my line by myself. And I see somebody come up behind me out of the corner of my eye. And I turn to say something to him and there's no one there. And I'm like, what? Okay. You know? So I went back to my crossword puzzle. And again, just a couple minutes later, I see literally out of the corner of my eye, my peripheral vision, I can see someone standing right behind my left shoulder. And I can even see what he's wearing. He's got on khaki pants and a Navy shirt. He looked like a geek squad member from Best Buy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I look again, and when I turn my head to look, there's no one there. And I'm like, you, I could feel an energy. I could feel somebody's energy there, you know, because I was getting good at that. I'm pretty good at I can feel your energy, and it's like a fingerprint. So I could feel their energy as well as see them, but only in my peripheral vision. So when it happened the third time, I'm like, I didn't move my head this time. But I said out loud, thank God there wasn't anywhere around. I see you. I don't know who the F you are, but I see you. And bam, he was gone without me turning my head. And the feeling of some energy behind me was gone. The next day, it happened again. Only this time there were two of them. It was like he went and got one of his buddies and brought his buddy with him. They both had on the same outfit. And I could almost see their face, but it was almost like their face was pixelated, like intentionally blurred so that I couldn't see their face, but I could see them. And one of them was kind of leaning in a little more as if to try and see me, you know, differently at a different angle, like one was here and one was there. And I said again, out loud, and like I said, thank God I'm running my line by myself because I probably would have been taking a medical. But I said, I see both of you and I don't know who you are and I don't know what you want with me, but you need to off because, you know, factory girl here, I speak like a sailor, but they both jumped back and the feeling went away. The energy feeling stopped and it's never happened again. That was 10 years ago. It's never happened again. It's never happened before. I can't explain it. I wasn't sick. I I don't know what that was, but I wrote it down. Just like I write every other weird thing down that happens to me. Have you you checked to see if anybody died at that plant? Oh, plenty of people died in that plant. Plenty. That plant's been there for like 80 years. You know, hell, just in the 15 years I was there. Probably 10 people had heart attacks there. These guys were both dressed like alike, like they worked, like they were at work somewhere. You know what I'm saying? But it wasn't, we don't, we didn't wear uniforms or anything like that in my job. I would wear jeans and hoodies. So I don't know who they were, what they were. Something was strange. I don't know where they were from, what was going on. But anyway, that's just my life. But they saw you as well. Well, they were looking right at me. I think they were shocked that I could see them. I don't, don't ask me. I have no idea. I'm just telling you what I remember. And then I have arthritis in my hands. They're horrible. Old. I can't even open my garage door. I have to make, get my husband to open my water bottles and pops. It's a wreck. Matter of fact, I'm getting ready to have some more steroid shots in this hand, but I don't know why. When I was at a UFO conference one time, people were sitting around bending spoons. You know what I mean? And I knew the lady who was doing that. And I picked a spoon up 
and it got hot in my hand right away. And as soon as it started getting hot, I just twisted it. And it, it, I, I got four twists in it. I mean, just literally. And it was really hot when I was after I twisted. It was so hot. You could feel the heat really intensely, almost where you couldn't hold it. But as soon as it cooled off and everybody tried to twist it back, it wouldn't budge. You couldn't budge it. So I got me a bunch of spoons at the Goodwill and started practicing on that. I found the cheap ones don't work. They just break. They, they snap in half. So you have to get a good one. Like I was using false craft silverware because it's fairly heavy and it's pretty mm -hmm. thick. And I can't open my garage door, but I can put five or six twists in a spoon. <laughs> Go figure. So things like that. And then the, the dreams. I had a dream about a black hole one time. Imagine in my dream, and as a, a dream, I assume, I am. I am just existing. I'm like hanging in space. I am. Here I am. And in front of me is a black hole. And I don't know how I can see it other than to tell you, try to imagine being in blackness and seeing a black hole. But I could. Mm -hmm. I knew it was there. And there was red and green energy around it and coming in and out of it. And there were some things coming out and some things going in, but there was little particles flipping around all over around the edges of it. And somebody behind me said in my ear, do you see the leakers? And I'm like, yeah, okay. And then I woke up. What side did you hear that from? Was it on your left or your right side? It was on this. It's on always. I always hear it on my right side. And that is the side that I got the burning in my ear on June 30, 83, by the way. It's always over my right side. Do you see the leakers? That's what it said. Like, and what were uh, the leakers? The green particles or the? They were the little particles all around the edge. You know, there were some shooting through the centers and some, some coming out the center, but there were these little tiny dots all around the edge of both colors. And uh, I assume that's what the voice was talking about, the leakers. I don't know, but I drew a picture of it. So many questions. I, I, tell me about it. I, none of it makes any so sense to me. Questions. My, I was watching my kid play with one of those big bubble wands that make big blobs of bubbles, you know, mm -hmm. sitting out in the yard, just chilling. And one of those big blobs of bubbles floated in front of me. And this is where I had my Roy from Close Encounters of the Third Kind moment, where I'm like, I know that. The bubbles all connected together. And I drew a picture of it. And somebody told me, I don't know who some voice in my head said, those are universes. And yeah, that, that, that's, that's brain theory, brain, B R N E. And they were um, telling me that the little places where they touch, they become one, but it's fleeting and it changes. So it, you have to move quickly. Those are the places where you can pass through but it's not stable and it's not permanent. It, so you have to get in and get out. Otherwise you can't return home. I guess. I don't know. They just said it was fleeting and not stable. They move like the soap bubble. Yeah. I've got a weird brain. I recently started trying to read science books because I have absolutely no idea what I'm reading, but something is telling me, put these words in there and we'll arrange them later. So I'm like, okay, you know, it, now reading is difficult for me. So I, I have to do audiobooks. audiobooks because my eyes are so weak anymore. I, if I try to read for 10 minutes, I can't even hold them open. And I've become fascinated with that. We talked earlier before you started to record, you know, that there's life all around us. That's when I got involved with paranormal research. And there has to be a connection between paranormal research and UFO research. I don't care how resistant either one is to the other. There's some connection. Whether that common denominator is the experiencer or not, I'm not for sure, but it seems like that to me. But there is a connection. And I got extremely fascinated with EVPs and recording these disembodied right. voices. And my paranormal group I started working with called me the antenna because for some reason or another, I would get the best ones. And I do have some really awesome ones. 
but my first one I recorded about 30 years ago with my nephew. And it was an old man's voice, and it said very clearly, are the spirits listening? And the moment that I heard that voice on that tape, I had this epiphany, and I realized, oh, my God, we're the spirits somewhere else, and somebody's listening for us and hearing snippets of us. So now, progress to 30 years later, I firmly believe whatever is the closest to us dimensionally or whatever, there are people there that know we're here and are actively seeking to make contact. There are people here that know they're there and they're actively seeking to make contact. And then there's people like me that aren't actively trying to do anything, but just have a normal life and it's happening to them. I really feel like a lot of the stuff I've recorded as a paranormal researcher that people would call ghosts never were alive here and are actually alive somewhere else right now, you know, and I could also, it could also be a time thing too, right? Since all time is supposedly simultaneous time is an artifact of man. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten obsessed with time travel. I, I don't know why, but I'm 100%. But certain. it's not really travel. It's happening now. Right. Right. It's just on a different frequency, right? Just imagine a radio station. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And you just tune to a different frequency. The transmission's happening at the same time as the other transmission. Yeah. And I think some of, us, frequency. some of us have gotten an extra tuner knob in the deal here. I don't know if I was born with it, if it was a, a natural evolutionary change that needed to happen that's coming out in people like me and and younger people, or if it was something that was instigated or triggered or caused by something else. But yeah, and I just see the world in a completely different way than not only the old me before June 30, 83, but a lot of people I know now. It's just so much of a bigger place. I'm just aware. And I had a conversation in my head with something not too long ago. I was just out walking around, taking a chill, enjoying the last bit of nice weather before it got crappy out in the fall, feeling very, very relaxed and very connected to earth energy and all that. And I heard a voice say, hey, Deb. And then I said, hey, because, you know, <laughs> 64 years old, I'm used to this. He said, Did you know that where I'm from, you look like a little ball of white light bouncing around in the dark? He says, and that's what I look like to you. He said, but really, where I am, I look just like you. And I said, really? I said, are you dead? And he laughed and he said, I'm as as alive as you are. And I said, well, are you those gray guys? And he said, no. And then the conversation was over. As quickly as it started, it stopped. So, of course, as soon as I got home, I wrote down every bit of it and with a date and time, because that's what I do. That's what my last two books have been. So, you know, someday it might mean something or it might just mean that I'm just crazy. (laughs) Why, Why don't you think this is more mainstream? It feels to me like something or someone is suppressing this. But why? Well, that and the fact that look at the stigma attached to just reporting a UFO light in the sky. Okay. Military and pilots, they can tell you, even I can tell you, 40 years ago, it was a much different environment than it is now. Now, people like they go out and seek it, they think it's cool. Everybody's got a podcast, it's just saturated to the point where, as a researcher, It would be extremely difficult to research a case nowadays because you would have to wonder how much contamination is already. I even wonder that of myself at this point. I'm 64. It's everywhere. I'm just writing down things like I just told you and just keeping a journal on that. But back in the day, you didn't tell people about this, not unless you wanted to wear a, a jacket with extra buckles on it and sleep in a room with walls that are really soft. You know, I mean, or keep your job. There's a book you should read. I don't even know if there's an audio book for it, though, because it's an older book. But it's called Stalking the Wild Pendulum. It is by Itzhak Bentov. He's an autodidact physicist. And he goes through a lot of 
what you're talking about, kind of he takes quantum physics and then he takes, for lack of a better word, the paranormal and finds a way to reconcile the two. And the book, I think, is so useful that even if you go over to the CIA's website with declassified documents, there's a DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, document called the Gateway Project or something like that, where they were citing his work about the cosmic egg, about different frequencies and the way that time is simultaneous. He talks about the Planck length, the length at which Newtonian physics is no longer useful, but quantum mechanics start, the weird effects of quantum mechanics, the double slit experiment, all that stuff. And it really merges quantum physics and quantum consciousness in a way that may help you make sense of some of your experiences, not all. Now, the problem is that the book was written in the late 70s. So I'm not sure if the quantum physics is still the same or if there's, I mean, there's certainly been some advances, but I think it still generally holds up pretty well. But it's the book that a lot of people read before they become physicists because it inspires them to do so. But anyway, highly recommend that book. Well, that's good and to then, know. Yeah. But you have this seeking for quantum I physics. I do. And everything. And I got attracted to sound and learning about vibrations and sound after having the hell vibrated out of me with that light. And I began to realize that everything around me vibrates at a certain yeah. frequency. And if it doesn't harmonize with how I'm vibrating, I'm not comfortable in it. My husband, I've changed my dining room table three times. He's like, what is wrong? When are we going to be done with this? You know, I'm like, I don't like the way it looks. I get it in there. It looked good in the store, but then I don't know, you know, and I've finally realized that it's because it's not harmonizing with me as an energy, you know, but then I find something that does. So, and now we're good. And I realized, you know, my entire life I spent listening to music as even a teenager and all that. It's like I lived my whole life to a soundtrack. And then I began to realize that it wasn't necessarily the music. It was the vibration of the mm -hmm. tones that make me feel a certain way. So I've been real fascinated with sound you can't see it. It's probably blown out. It's a white crystal bowl back there that you hit and it has a certain sound to it. I liked that one because every time I do that instantly from the top of my head down, I could feel it run down my whole body, this warm tingle sensation that completely relaxes me. I feel my jaw relax. It's an instantaneous feeling. And my body is responding to the vibration of the sound. And it's not like new agey vibrate. I'm talking no. about science and that I am a bunch of water molecules that react to the sound around me. Like, and if somebody's mean, negative and yelling, I feel it in my body. You know what I mean? I'm connecting to this body in different ways than I did before June 30, 83. It's so hard to explain and not sound like I'm no, no, no. Sci science absolutely explain, and I think it's related to this whole different realities and dimensions, whatever you want to call it. When we talked about different frequencies, it could be as if everything is existing all at once. You don't see it because it's just vibrating at a slightly different frequency, and even the realities we see it is not really the way it is. We are literally, literally, science will back this up, vibrating light and sound. 99.999% of us is empty space. And the rest of it is we're made up of photons and phonons. And that's the other interesting thing. If you look at, there's been new research on these things called phonons, which are quantum units of vibration. Did you know they have negative mass and negative gravity? No, I did not. So from a subatomic level, sound actually goes up. It moves away. It, it, it lifts. Mm -hmm. So at the quantum scale, it, it's literally a path for 
anti-gravity. Now, I don't know if you can, at the you know quantum scale, raise it to the macro scale. Anyway, I didn't mean to take it on a tangent, oh. but just to back up what you're saying, we are literally vibrating light and sound. And it's weird because, you know, remember when you asked me in the beginning about dreams that I had when I was a kid, I had a dream as a child, as a young child that has always stayed with me. Again, I was just being, I was in this dark place, but it wasn't really dark. I was just existing. And I saw this bright sun in front of me and this bright sun exploded and it exploded into an infinite number of shards of golden light. And it was so beautiful. But then I saw each one of these shards go into something and it went into animal or person. And it wasn't just human persons. I mean, it was just everywhere. And it was at that moment, somebody said to me, we are all part of that one thing. We are all the same. All of us, all things alive are the same. And I was a little kid and I'm like, yeah, that's so cool, you know. And I wrote it down. I've wrote it down. I was probably in at least one of the books. So you can look at that scientifically or spiritually. But I mean, I was like in elementary school when I had this dream. Well, what kind of kid has a dream like that in elementary school, you know, and remembers it. But it was, again, one of those t- kinds of dreams. It's just like, I know where I was when I heard the Judy Garland died. I know where I was when I watched the Challenger explode. I know exactly what I was doing when Kennedy was assassinated. I, I was, you know, what, four years old, but I knew something big happened because my dad cried. And I remember sitting next to him watching TV and my dad with his head in his hands crying. So, And I remember that even at that young age, certain things impress you so much that they make such an impact on you that it stays there. And that dream was another one like that. Did you, so, did you get the sense that you were the sun or you were the black hole? No, I just felt as if I was an observer. Okay. So read it, Sak Bentov, Stalking the Wild Pendulum, because okay. there's two things you said that are directly related to that book. So when you talked about the shards, he talks about everything has some quanta or quantum of consciousness. Even every rock, every being, you know, that consciousness is just more evolved in some beings than it is in others. So it's more evolved in us than it is in, say, plant life. But even plant life observes and has some quantum of consciousness. The second thing you said with yelling and the energy that it produces and it has its own negative energy. There's an experiment, and this is just science. If you take a bunch of pendulums that are near each other and you just swing them in random directions, they always end up in sync. And again, it's part of this energy vibration, what you put out to the world. And I hope I'm not sounding new agey. I'm trying to. Yeah, I know. I It sounds all, and a lot of people mistake it when they hear me talk about it. They, they think I'm so into all the new agey stuff, but I've never was exposed to much of that anywhere. That's not how I feel this or, or see this. I see this as a science of some kind yeah. that I don't understand. Yeah, we just don't understand it yet. And I think people who see a lot of the stuff that they see who have been called crazy in the past, and again, this is an Itzhak Bentov concept, is I think there's some video of him on the internet. And he's like, what do you call the most highly evolved humans today? And somebody said, oh, geniuses, this and that. He's like, no, crazy. <laughs> Ta-da! And you want to hear something else crazy too? Right. I got my high school transcripts when I had my IQ test in high school. It was 111. Nah. Uh, you know, respectable. My late husband convinced me that I could take the test and be invited to Mensa. I'm like, oh, I was in remedial government. I, I suck at math. There's no way. He convinced me to do it. And I took the 
non-proctored test and was invited to take the proctored test. Now, this was only maybe, okay, I took that in high school and then I was probably 30 when I took the test for Menza, maybe. I can't remember. I scored 141 on the Cattell B and 135 in the 99th percentile of, a, of another test and in the half top half percentile in spatial relations. And I was invited to join Menza. So I did because it would look good on a job application, you know, mm-hmm. but something in my brain changed something in the way my mind began to work changed from high school till after June 30, 83. And that's a big jump. I don't think you jump that big on an IQ you're, test. You're, once no, you're not 16. supposed to. Well, yeah, you're I did. supposed to get, it's supposed to be consistent. So, no, well, mine's not. And I have the documentation to prove it. I don't know what it means. It could mean IQ testing is just BS. I don't know. But I know my mind started working differently after June 30, 83. Took a minute to get revved up, you know, because like I said, I thought I was having a nervous breakdown for the first year. But once I got my sea legs, I guess, I took off running. So, you have any advice for folks who are experiencing these sort of things? Number one, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid. I know a lot of stuff I had happened to me was scary and traumatic and fearful, but being afraid didn't change anything. I actually even remember being told that fear would slow down whatever process I was going through. So try not to be afraid. Yeah, I'm not hardly afraid of anything, but don't be afraid and don't feel like you're alone because we're everywhere. You know, thank God for the Internet now, because back in the day, I was basically alone here in Indiana for 25 years before cell phones and the Internet and everything. So connect with other people like you and share your experiences with other people, sometimes just getting them out and hearing them come out of your mouth or seeing them down on paper helps you to be able to deal with them more effectively. And that would be my advice is to just don't be afraid to reach out. And hopefully the stigma will continue to decrease. I feel it's decreased a lot since 1983. And I'm hoping that this UAP disclosure stuff with the military will at least give military people and other people a little more confidence that they can speak out about things without losing their jobs or their pension or it being ridiculed, you know. Yeah. This thing's never coming out through official channels. I'm telling oh, you. Oh, no, no, no. Absolutely not. Never. But never. No, the, the, whatever the phenomenon is, is what is going to dictate when it's ready. And it's going to use us not a government. It's going to use the people that it's already connected with. Yeah, we'll see. We'll and ain't see. nobody going to stop you. You can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. I'm sorry. So They'll try. <laughs> well, yeah, they'll try. But you know what? The phenomenon seen... is bigger yeah, than that's them. that's true. It's bigger yeah, than it's... any of us. Well, it also depends on, and again, I'm speaking out of complete ignorance here, it depends on how many faces it has, because that's not to say that there's some aspect of the phenomena that wants to be revealed. And there might be some aspect of the phenomena that has an incentive not to be revealed. Right. Mm-hmm. You can't have good without evil. Exactly. Right? right. You wouldn't recognize either one without the other. And you might not even recognize what is the good and what is the, right. the evil. Something that's suitably advanced it's not going to come to you like a threat and Um, if i'm telling you if anything really if if the controlling power that be or whatever's running this was the negative one we would not be here that would have been a long time ago gone so we've got something good on our side i hope so 
I'm also a science fiction, a horror writer, so I can come up with like 10 different scenarios no, where if, no, no, we no. can still be here. We can still be here, but I don't want to, I don't want to, because those are scary. Those are scary. You, it, right? no, if you can think it, you can make it happen. So just don't even put that in your head. Yeah. yeah I, <laughs> I, I, I won't, I won't, but I appreciate your time, Debbie. It was an absolute pleasure. Anything I can do to help move this forward in my own small way i am more than happy to do that's why i'm here (laughs) all right well i appreciate it debbie it was an absolute pleasure thank you for having me if you enjoyed this video please click on like subscribe and the notification button so that you're alerted anytime i post something new 